part two of the Full Bloom interview with guitarist Chris Holmes. You can listen to part one on YouTube or at fullandbloom.com. Click the links in the description. When you're recording your guitars nowadays, are you just using a plug-in or micing an amp, or how are you tracking your guitars nowadays? I got, for for what I've been doing I, since um, I did the first record with Phil in an apartment, I use a, a thing called um, a G, a Digitech GPS of eleven hundred. It's a pro, it's just a, a rack mounted one space rack mount. It's a preamp and it's um. It's all digital. It doesn't have any tubes or nothing, and uh, it's made to go either into power amps or you can go straight in. You can go straight into the, the the computer that way from the back of that. I use that. It's almost like a plug-in because it's all digital on the sure. site anyway. Right. And so back in the day, what was the secret to your guitar sound? Where were you just going straight into a Marshall? And how did they record your guitars back in the day? I would use a, a 100-watt 1971. I don't like, didn't like the plexiglass amp Marshalls because they don't have enough power. They don't push enough juice for some reason. I always found the ones with the metal plate or the old super lead hundreds were the better sounding to what I like. Most people like the plexi sound. I don't. That's what Van Halen uses. What's really important is when you record is have a good sounding cabinet. I mean, that's what you need. That's really important. Best ones that I've ever used are Marshalls, you know, because the way the wood's made. I also had a job before Wasp. I worked at Sir One Vega Speaker Company. So I learned a lot about miking speakers and all that stuff and amp to sound. You know, and I'd, I'd use a Marshall. I like the Marshalls just stock. I don't like, you know, this Jose mod or that mod or this. I like them just ran stock, cranked on 10. And then I'd just go from my guitar straight into the amp. And were you recording with your Jackson, like yeah, all those albums? the black one. Yeah. It's the black one. Are you the still, one I still got today. You still, that's, I was wondering if that was the one with Manson on it. That's the same one from like the very first album, the one you're playing in like, I want to be somebody video and all that. <laughs> yeah, that one's di- that one did every Wasp album I ever played on, every solo. Holy that I played. shit! Unbelievable. Every one. I still got it. Still got it. Same frets. I don't, you know, same frets that are in there. It's the same ones that have always been in there. I don't know how I. I I, I would save and use it. I use it a bit, a bit on the road, uh, but then I'd put it away and just use it for recording. But I got it with me now. And that's the one you still record with, huh? Yeah, yeah. That or my, or I got a yellow one that's really beat up that I just like. I just, so I like it because I don't have to clean it. I broke it about four times, and you just, you know, ask the company Jackson to get a new neck and just bolt on a new neck and glue the body back together. <laughs> I haven't broke lately for a long time, but um. I like that guitar. It's a star body. I remember that one. With just a tail, just on tail stop. It originally had a, the springs, the slot for the springs and a whammy bar and all that stuff when I bought it. I don't know what kind of body it was, Mighty Might or whatever at first, but I had cut the wood out, a pieces of wood and glued in the springs and stuff because I didn't want a whammy bar. I cut them out and measured it, the wood so it fit in there really, really good and then just put a regular stock tail piece in, and a bridge. I like the way the guitar rings. And Dwayne Barron was the one that recorded your guitars on the self-titled album? No, 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 no. Mike Varney and I, um, a guy named, his name was Steve Fontano. Right, yeah. He, he engineered? engineered okay, and Dwayne wasn't involved with it at all? Not on the first album. He was at Pasha. Okay. The second album was Spencer, the Last Command. And he, and he helped engineer, he set up the engineer for the, the third album, but, but Alex mostly did all the work on it. Uh, the guy named Alex. Yeah, Alex yeah. Waltman, which I interviewed him. I got to, we talked yeah. about the inside the electric circus. Alex tracked everything and did this and that, but Dwayne, and Dwayne was still working at Pasha at the time, but he was getting ready to go work. But he came in and helped set up most of the stuff. Okay. Yeah, and there was some stuff on that first album, and this torture never stops. The riff, the beginning riff, you cannot physically play it that good. And, and I had to, with Fontano and me sitting in the studio, we did three tracks of guitars that were three different things to make it sound like one. So what, you recorded three tracks, like did two, one left, one right, one in the middle, or what? No, no, I did the chunks. Dun-dun, 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 dun-dun. And then another one I did. Oh, I got you. Then I tracked another one. dun 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 because you can't physically play that, or, or I couldn't physically play that like that, that clean. What's on the record? Van Halen probably could. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I'm not that skilled. Randy played a few solos, but he didn't, since 
they wanted the guitars to match up the second track. I always played the second track because I could match it up almost perfect. I had interviewed a guy named Rick Browdy, and he had said that he worked with you guys. He said, like, almost recording the first album. Do you recall anything about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, t- he took us into um, where they did the, uh, A&M Records, where I think um, they did We Are the World, and they, they recorded We Are Stars. He took us in 82, 83. I couldn't even tell you the songs we recorded. I couldn't right now. I couldn't remember. I remember, um, I do remember something funny. Well, I'll tell you a funny story about that session because that was the only time really we were at A&M besides the time doing the Dio thing. Um, we recorded, the Commodores were in the daytime and we had recorded at night, you know, like 12 o'clock to 8 in the morning. And uh, we were done recording one day and about seven and I'm sitting out front and this guy, I just, it had to be 83. I'm sitting out front and this guy pulled up right where you're not supposed to park right in front. It's reserved for, <laughs> it was reserved for him. I didn't know, but it's the most beautiful Jaguar. Um, and the paint was just unbelievable. When he got out of his car, I just went, man, I go, is that a stock paint job? And the guy stopped and he goes, no. He goes, I just had it painted a few months ago. I go, that's a beautiful paint job. And he goes, he goes, you like it? I go, yeah. He goes, I got four other. I go, what do you mean? He goes, I got four other cars like that. I go, what? <laughs> and I come, come to find out, it, it was um Richard Carpenter. Oh, wow. And he was in the studio, and his, his sister had just died, I guess, a few months before, and he was going through some songs. Was, but he's way cool dude, man. And I, he talked to me about his car. I didn't know it was him. I could, you know, I didn't hit my brain. Somebody told me later on the next day that that was Richard Carpenter. And I was like, wow, man. He, it, and it kind of tripped me out that he was, you know, a guy that far up in the music business that Rich would actually talk to a scumbag like me, you know? <laughs> I mean, I was nobody then, you know? Uh, yeah, but that's, yeah. But... I, was a little guy, I was a little guy flicking a few stakes at the troubadour on, on people. <laughs> you know, at, at, a, at a club, right? Right, yeah. You know, and, and, you know he said he, he just started telling me about how many car, he, how many cars he's got. I go, how many cars do you actually own? And he kind of put his hand on his chin. He's looking in the air and he's counting. And he comes back. He goes, I think 104. And I go, 104. Where in the fuck do you park them? And he goes, I bought a systems parking lot. And at the time, I still didn't know who it was, but I, it, I, was, I was like, wow, maybe he's telling me the truth. But then somebody told me it was Richard Carpenter. It's cool meeting people like that. No but anyway, shit. That, that was a session Brody was doing. I don't know whatever happened with him and Blackie. But when you guys are working with Rick, that's like before you guys have the deal with Capital, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It was to get a recording so we could have something to shop around. Rick Brody was supposed to shop it around and help us get a deal. I got you. Does anything stand out like from those early Wasp shows in L.A.? I mean, you guys were just massive in a rather short time, right? Well, we we um, you know, we had an we had an idea doing a shows a radical show in a certain in the clubs with fire a stage show being Blackie Lawless instead of Steve Duran. You know what I mean? He was into being that person on stage and his. I'm sure, have you ever seen Rage Dungeon Master, Rage War? Uh, that's one of my questions, yeah. I was going to ask when that was done, because it looked like kind of early in the game, right? That um, that character that Blackie's playing, that's him on stage. He likes to be that character, chopping up the meat and throwing it in the audience. But when you get off stage, it's not the same person. Here's the thing is about when the bus goes down the highway, Steve Dern gets off the bus, goes on, goes in the dressing room, puts on Blackie Lawless, goes out on stage, does the Blackie Lawless show, gets off stage, takes off Blackie Lawless, comes Steve Dern, walks out of the dressing room. Chris gets off the bus, walks in the dressing room, puts on the stage clothes, goes out on stage, it's still Chris. Takes off the stage clothes, still Chris, walks out, still Chris. So this, it doesn't, it never changed for me. I never have put myself into a different kind of character to put myself in a different character to get on stage. I would, I, it's not even something I could think about. I wouldn't even, I couldn't even comprehend doing that. But that's what Blackie is. His real name is Steve Duran. He puts on the Blackie Lala show. Right. Yeah. And I don't want to, I don't want to piss your wife off. I feel like we're treading on that uh, fine yeah, line. Yeah, I promise her. <laughs> you know, that's how it was. And yeah, but Rick Brody, he, he, you know, I, I don't really know, didn't know Rick that good, but he was a cool guy. He knew if we got a deal, what would that, you know, it could be a big situation compared to all the bands that were happening at the time trying to get deals. You know, Rat, Motley had already gotten just 
they just gotten signed by some I couldn't even tell you who. Um, Electra. It could have been. They were they had an EP come out and they were just starting to they played Magic Mountain and they were just going up the ladder. We hadn't got there yet. And then a few other bands got signed. Warrior did, Rat got signed. Um oh God. Great White. Talking, Great White. Everybody was signed. We did we weren't signed yet. What about that blood drive show? Does that stand it, out at all? That was just, you know, publicity to do three shows because you can get publicity from the blood drive you know they'll promote it and then the dungeon master when you guys film that is that like early hey, hey, i got i got one thing i did hear an interview with randy and he at the beginning of wasp he didn't explain the right thing about blackie playing bass and guitar and stuff like that when i joined the band wasp before i joined randy was in the band there was a bass player named don costa Right, yeah, I've tried to search for Don all through the well, years. <laughs> Randy, Randy, Randy doesn't mention that. When so, I joined Wasp, it was Don Costa, Blackie on rhythm, and Tony playing drums. And I, Randy was in the band, but they threw him out to get me in. When I joined Don Costa, and it was Tony, Don Costa, and Don was an outrageous player. He played with his fingers. And he'd, like, cut he himself on up. stage and do all kinds of shit. He would have been great in Wasp. <laughs> yeah. It, well, what happened is we played the first show, and uh, Don, he was playing his bass out of tune. The last two songs that really flipped me out and pissed me off. And he was playing with his amp on. He was playing notes. If you're out of tune, you shut your guitar off or your amp, or your big, whatever. You shut off and you tune it. You don't play out of tune, but he's played out of tune. And I told him, I go, Don, if you ever play out of tune again, uh, I'm going to chew your balls off and spin them in your face on stage. Don't ever, ever do that with me again. He quit. So we had some shows lined up and Blackie flipped, freaked out and was like, blame me for it. Blah, 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 blah. And he's like, well, we can bring Randy back in. He knows the songs and I'll just switch over to the bass. That's what happened. That's the correct Randy Piper didn't know about that and then he saw you know about me and sister but anyway that's how blackie went to bass he brought in randy because randy could sing he already knew all the songs and and plus the deal was i was only going to be in the band in the band i told blackie i'd be in it for seven months to a year and then i was gone because i didn't want to be in a band like sister i didn't want to work like that i wasn't happy i don't want to be i don't want to play music and be unhappy i want to do what van halen has done It'd be like them. But it was like a just-in-case-they-got-signed kind of deal? He promised a record deal within five months, six months from me joining. And that's why after Don quit, he was freaking out wanting to get it done, you know. But brought in Randy. Randy was always cool to me, you know. He played guitar. We didn't step on, we didn't step on each other's shoes about playing guitar, leads, or whatever. He did his bag. I did mine. Randy's Randy. And Blackie knew what he was doing, you know. Then we got Rod Smallwood came in the deal, and boom, that was it. We did use Brody, tried to do that situation, you know, and it was one big clusterfuck. And then from there, though, once you get the deal with Capital, that's when you start working with Mike Varney and Fontano? Yeah, I do have to pay credit and homage to, uh, uh, there's a guy named Kurt Stites, another guy named Kurt Levis, and Ron Jack, um, who, from 1982 to 1984, they're the ones that that had the shop one guy's dad owned a shop in pasadena that we made all the wasp props if it wasn't for those guys wasp would not be where it is today even Guaranteed. the big sign above the drum they set built the sign, they built the sign the meat boxes all the pyrotechnics they built the, the torture rack everything the drum riser everything and he's in the everything. documentary right one of the guys yeah. is kurt, yeah well kurt levis that's the guy in the documentary but there's another guy named kurt stites there's another guy named Ron Jack. All these guys, Russell Wallace. He was a, he he worked with Wasp for a while. They're all people that I went to school with because I was born there. I got a lot of friends. Tony, he didn't have too many friends. Randy didn't have too many friends, and Blackie did. And I'm I'm the guy that everybody, their whole road crew was. You know where all the equipment would go after with the shows and stuff like that. It was all my friends. And what's really sad is they were all offered jobs. Once we got a record deal, right? To go on the road, and then all of a sudden, when we got a record deal, Blackie's like, we got to hire professionals now. It, it kind of hurt me, but there's, those guys are still my friends even today. I loved how Kurt still had the original propane tank for the Wasp sign. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, from the... From the yeah, yeah, those guys, we all sat and built those over at Kurt Stites' dad's shop. <clears throat> all, this, all this stuff. I remember when we hooked up the 
the, the sign to blow the flames, they hooked them up with the barbecue regulators and the flames came out about two inches, right? Because I drilled, we drilled a one, a one inch ID pipe, every hole, every inch in it all the way around. And, and I was like, man, we take, we got to get a coupling to take these regulators off and blow pure gas through and it'll kick ass. Once we did that, boy, it was good. The flames came out about two feet. Doing that, doing that kind of stuff, there is no book to look through and figure out how to do that. We just, you know, it was just trial and error. I'm surprised it passed code to even be able to there be used. No, there is no code. What code of what? There was no code? You didn't have to pass anything to get that, fire that thing off in the clubs? No, we just set it up and did it. Who's going to stop you? <laughs> oh, shit. And then, and then on top of the amps, we, we had built pipe bombs with just the top taken off. We just uncapped the top of one, and you put two leads in there with gunpowder. We did put a piece of wood around so you couldn't see them. And again, in case they blew up, we used those as concussion bombs. <laughs> one night, we were playing the Troubadour, and a Blackie took the meat box at the end of the show. And it was a, we had already done the last, so the last song, right, of the night. And we were banging out the notes and waiting for Tony to hit the last you know, da -da -da -da, boom, and we're done. And Blackie throws this meat box through the, the sign that was burning at the end because we'd, we'd light it at the beginning and have just the flames going with no lights on it. And it's really cool playing the f just flames. It's a bitchin' doing that. It's, it's the only lights in the club. And then at the end, we did it. At the very last end, and Blackie had, was doing the Blackie Lawless, whatever, you know, his little character. And he threw the meat, bo the meat box that had the meat in it that... He only threw an audience that had blood. He threw that through the sign. It bounced against the black wall. It happened to hit me right in the temple on the head. Oh, Knocked shit. me out. Oh. Yeah, yeah. But the roadies had to carry me up the stairs. They couldn't even get to wake, bring me to. Do you even remember getting hit, or was it a total blackout moment? I just remember waking up in the dressing room, and they go, Chris, you all right? <laughs> you know, yeah, it's just part of what, what went on. You know, it's no big deal. Yeah, Tony had talked about how he loved the, the sign. He said the sign would, like, be so incredibly hot because it was yeah. right over him, but he said it would totally get his adrenaline going. Well, we'd set it up in the front part of the drum riser, not the back. And we set it up high, so it was above him, a little bit right above him. If we set it up against the wall, it'd catch the wall on fire. That's and you guys toured with that, right, on that first? I saw you guys on, like, I looked it up, December 22nd, 1984 in Dallas. You guys played a venue called the Arcadia, kind of a smaller venue, maybe 800 people. And I can't yeah. even remember if... Um, I, I don't think that we had that sign. We didn't think... Yeah, yeah, we only used it in a Troubadour, and then we used it... When we did the sting in nine in two thousand, when we did the, the sting, we used the sign, same sign. Oh wow, that sign still is out there. We didn't have it up in here; it was just set in front of the drums. Oh, okay, but that sign yeah. still exists. Yeah, all it is is a sign made out of wood, wasp, and then the out and around wasp, like a frame, is just a pipe. Go make it at the hardware store. I don't know if they got it now still today. You know, I don't know where all my stage clothes crap and all that stuff is. The only thing I'd get from touring is, is just my guitars back. That's about it. The guitars I was endorsed, I'd get those back. But everything else on the road would be in the cases. I would care less where they went. It wasn't my job to worry about that. Tom.